Okay, welcome everybody. Chapter 17. It's called Grand Portage, and they made it to their destination, which is right here. Grand Portage. Here's Lake Superior. Uh, this is in northern, what is now called northern Minnesota. Back then, this wasn't Minnesota. Minnesota didn't become a state yet until 1858. The story takes place in 1803. Okay? So, they made it to their destination, and what they brought with them in these canoes are what's called manufactured goods. Pots, pans, kettles, uh, muskets or rifles. Or what we would, would, today we call rifles. They weren't called that then. They're called muskets, bullets, knives, things that are made of metal, needles, also some cloth, some dyes. Okay, these are what they're trading here. This is what the, this party they're going to is called the rendezvous. Once a year it's held. It's a big, big party. And so they're bringing with them manufactured goods and they're going to pick up beaver furs to take back on their trip back to Montreal. Okay, so that's what today's chapter is about. Is about Grand Portage. So by the time Sherbano's crew finished unloading, the rest of the brigade had tapped a brandy keg. A brandy keg is a big wooden barrel filled with alcohol called brandy. If you don't care to pickle your brain, Sherbano offered, I'll show you the grounds. So they walked beyond the stockade to the encampment. Pierre was surprised to see two separate camps with a rushing creek between them. One was for the pork eaters, the men who headed back to Montreal before autumn. All right. Two types of uh, voyageurs, pork eaters and evernons. All right, evernons, that's pronounced evernon. The pork eater is what Pierre is. He's the kind of voyageur that goes out in April and to Mon Grand Portage, from Montreal to Grand Portage, and back at the same season. That's called a pork eater. An evernon, that's a guy who spends uh, a little bit longer. He went, spends the whole winter up in the North Country. Okay? So Pierre is not an evernon, not yet. Second book, yeah, he will be, but not right now. So they walk beyond the stockade to the encampment. Pierre was surprised to see two separate camps with Rushing Creek between them. One was for the pork eaters, the men who headed back to Montreal before autumn, and the other was for the Evernons, the men who wintered in company outposts to the north. Why two camps? Why don't, don't they talk to each other? Pierre asked. Remember, Pierre's just a 13-year-old kid experiencing this for the first time. Charbonneau laughed. Pierre was amazed at how relaxed the men had the man was this afternoon. They talk just fine, he answered. The problem is, their talk always leads to fighting. Evernons like to boast. And the worst of the whole lot are the Athabascans. The company keeps them apart so they won't kill each other. Pierre nodded. His father had told him many stories about Athabascans, that company of voyageurs who were legendary for their strength and endurance. Their standard packs were 110 pounds, and they were hired for five-year terms. They bragged constantly and liked to prove their toughness in fights with other voyageurs. Up the hill behind the fort, Charbonneau stopped and announced grandly, Here it is, the carry that everyone talks about, the Grand Portage itself. Pierre looked up. In a nearly vertical path. One day, 
Charbonneau continued. You'll be proud to tell your grandchildren you stood here. Fort Charlotte and the Pigeon River are nine miles off, but what makes the trip so brutal isn't the distance. There's a 300-foot rise between here and there. The company tried horses and mules, but they decided it was cheaper to make men lame. So, this Grand Portage, it's called Grand Portage because it's a big portage. It's, it's a nine-mile portage, and it's a 300-foot rise in elevation. That might not sound like a lot, but it is. That's a lot. And they got to carry it from the fort, Fort Charlotte, to the Pigeon River. That's where they're trying to get to. They're trying to take all this manufactured goods, all these manufactured goods on this nine-mile portage. Like it says here, they used to use horses and mules, <laughs> but it turned out to be too expensive. So they thought it's cheaper to use people. And unfortunately, people got hurt by doing this. Doesn't make sense to you and I, but that's how they did it 200 years ago. Pierre imagined the agony of such carry and was glad to be a mere pork eater. The toughest portage on the Ottawa was nothing compared to this. The Ivernons had good reason to brag. Pierre led, Sherbano led Pierre toward a maze of birch bark wigwams. Let me introduce you to a few of my friends. He said, grinning like a man who'd been too long absent from home. As they approached the end edge of the Indian encampment, two men were wedging a long sheet of sewn birch bark between two rows of stakes that followed the rough outline of a north canoe. One of the men nodded to Charbonneau, but both kept working. Stones were piled on top of the bark sheeting to help form the hull. The men were getting ready to lash the gunnels to the top of the bark with cedar root lacing. Next, they'll fix the ribs in place, Charbonneau explained. And then the thwarts and the seats. That's all there is to it, Pierre asked. Just a few days drying and she'll be ready to caulk. Pierre looked at the graceful lines of the hull. He guessed the finished craft would be around 25 feet long. Are the North canoes faster than a Montreal? Pierre asked. Not only faster, but easier to portage and maneuver. The Jibwe have been perfecting these boats for centuries. You can run white water that would stave in a lake canoe. Sherbana was tracing the curve of the hull as he spoke. Why, I remember one day when we were running the Namakan River. Suddenly there was a war whoop behind them. Pierre whirled to see a tall Indian smothering Charbano in his arms. At first, Pierre thought his companion was being attacked, but then he saw Charbano grin as he, as he squeezed Charbano tight, the Indian sang out, Charbano, you old bone shaker. They pushed each other back to arm's length. And Charbonneau, sorry about this, had a chance to speak. So how was your winter, Mukwa? Pierre had never seen anything like Mukwa. To keep from laughing, Pierre covered his open mouth with his hand. The brave wore a wide-brimmed hat with a sash wrapped around the crown, holding three ostrich feathers up high above his head. A silk handkerchief was tied at his throat, and a red checkered shirt showed beneath his blue waistcoat. Lace was pinned to the shoulders and sleeves of the coat, and he wore dark burgundy knee breeches, though he didn't wear shoes. 
Peter noticed a gray sock on one foot and a red one on the other, each held up by a silk garter. You know the winters, my friend, Makawawi replied. The game goes a little farther out each year. But we survive. When he means game, he means animals that are available to hunt. The Indian spoke excellent French. He grabbed Charbonneau by the shoulders again. It is good to see you, Charbonneau. They squatted on the ground and visited a while longer, sharing news of the past year. After Charbonneau explained Lalonde's death, he said, We better get back to the fort and report in. I understand, Makwa said, but you must promise to feast with us before you leave this place. Makwa replied, I'd be flattered. We will talk of old times, he said, and bring your little friend. He can meet my daughter, Kenawa. Now off with you. As soon as they were called out of earshot, Pierre showed his anger at being called a little friend. Where do you ever get an outfit like that one? He sneered. Well, he's the chief, and he wears what he wants. A chief called Makwa? Uh, Makwa means bear in Ojibwe, Charbonneau explained patiently. The bear is a powerful spirit. As a member of the bear clan, he can tell you many stories, but according to custom, winter is the only season to share the old legends. He stopped. Since Lalonde's death, Charbonneau's gruff military manner had softened, and Pierre appreciated the way he often went out of his way to explain things. But I always thought Indian chiefs wore headdresses and buffalo robes, Pierre said. Makwa wears what his people regard as the finest dress of the civilized world. Bright clothes are a sign of wealth. The traders encourage it too. They're always willing to swap a bit of lace or a handkerchief for pelts. So the chief gets a bit gaudier every year. Do all the chiefs dress like that? No, Charbonne chuckled as he replied. Though you do run into, into a showy fellow now and then. Farther inland, the Indians dress as they always have. The men wear breech clouts, beaded leggings, and moccasins. The women, he paused for the slightest moment, the women wear the softest doeskin shifts you could ever imagine. And they're all decorated with tiny beads and colored grasses and quills. In winter, they wear rabbit skin robes. Charbonneau looked at Pierre's intense face, intent face, excuse me. We'd better check in with McKay before he decides we've run off for parts unknown. As they made their way back down the rocky hillside, Pierre tried to picture an inland village such as Charbonneau described. The dark-eyed women in their beaded doeskin dresses sounded like perfect visions from a dream. As they neared the stockade, Pierre saw that Grand Portage had come alive. Though only two dozen men had greeted them that morning, there seemed to be a thousand people milling around the stockade now. Charbonneau scoffed, Looks like the rascals have crawled out of bed. All it takes is the scent of rum to rouse them out. That night, a magnificent banquet was held in the great hall. Traders, clerks, and interpreters crowded along plank tables heaped with honey-glazed ham, venison, smoked trout, bread, and butter peas and Indian corn, potatoes and fresh milk. Mr. McKay and the other Northwest Company officials sat at the head table, but except for some fancy, bo fancy bottles of wine, their fare was no better than that of the men from the brigades. Six weeks of corn and salt pork had left Pierre ravenous for real food. 
all of the elegant dishes placed before him. He savored the garden peas and most, most of all, and milk, excuse me, and milk, most of all. He scorned vegetables back home, but the sweet, buttery flavor of the fresh-picked peas stirred his senses to a level of delight only surpassed by the thick, cream-topped mugs of milk. When his belly was full, Pierre sat back, a picture of contentment. From across the table, Emile gave him a broad grin and said, Do you suppose we could get Bellegarde to stop by the kitchen for lessons? They'd throw him out on his ear, Pierre said, chuckling. Or at least make him take a bath first, Emile added. As soon as the meal was over, Pierre was surprised to see the men carry the tables to the far end of the room. A bagpipe, a fiddle, and a flute appeared. And just as the music started, some young Indian women showed up at the door, dressed in their Sunday best. The men picked out partners and bowed. Bella, being slower than his mates to notice the women, nearly trampled two fellows and route to the door, displaying a cavalier spirit. He dropped to one knee before the lady of his liking. Pierre watched with pity, imagining the horror that would fill the girl's eyes when Belois lifted his scarred face. Yeah, remember Belois, a pretty ugly guy. Watch this, Pierre, said, Pierre whispered to Charbonneau. That girl will scream for sure when she sees his ugly mug. To Pierre's surprise, the pretty girl smiled and nudged her friend beside her. When Belois offered his arm, he and his chosen promenaded proudly to the dance floor. Did you see that? Pierre was shocked. What? Belois Bel and the girl? Well, yeah. She's so pretty, and he's an awful mess, Charbonneau offered, chuckling at Pierre's astonishment. It's a different world up here. Scars are a fact of life in the wilderness. They're badges of honor, tokens of a life lived hard and well. Pierre was still shaking his head in disbelief when he felt someone tap his shoulder. He turned to see a pretty Indian girl standing beside him. When she said something in Ojibwe to Pierre, Charbonneau burst out laughing. What did she say? Pierre asked, embarrassed by the sudden attention. She says she wants to dance with the handsome young Frenchman, Charbonneau translated. Apparently, all the young girls are talking about you. They like your blonde hair and your big muscles. Well, I thought you were an honest steersman, Pierre said. That's what the lady said. Are you serious? Believe what you want, Charbonno replied, but be polite. She's waiting for an answer. Oh, Pierre was flustered. Tell her that I don't know how to dance. Charbonneau grinned. He turned to the girl and spoke. When, she, when he finished, he took Pierre's hand, or when he finished, she, excuse me, she took Pierre's hand and led him onto the floor. Pierre glared, but glared back at Charbonneau, who grinned innocently. Don't look at me, he said. I only told her that you love dancing even more than battling your canoe. He laughed then as Pierre disappeared and among the whirling men and women. Okay, so our friends, the voyageurs, have reached Grand Portage, their destination. They're obviously going to make it back, but they've made some new friends. And the new friends are Ojibwe. We've studied the Ojibwe. They lived in northern Minnesota. And that's who the voyageurs are meeting up with here. They're meeting up with Ojibwe. And they're getting a new canoe, their Montreal canoe, which is 40 feet long. They're getting new ones made because it got beat.
beaten up pretty badly on the trip out west. All right, so looks like Pierre has changed a little bit, hasn't he, from the beginning of our story. He's gotten some muscles, his hair a little bit longer, and he's gained a little confidence. We'll see what happens next. Stay tuned, everybody.